announcement to make. So in your uh, diaries, you will find these postcards. If you want to send them to somebody, you could just write the addresses. And there is a box next to the exhibition space. And there are stamps there. So stick up the stamp, write down the addresses, and put it in that box, and we'll post it for you. Starting in a minute, so if everybody could just come in. Sorry. Ah, okay. There are postcards in this book, in this in this notebook. If you could just write the addresses, and then there are stamps next to a box in the exhibition space. If you can put in, uh, stick up the stamp, put in the um, box, and we will post it for you. Good evening, everyone. We are going to start with the last session for the day before the plenary. Uh, this session is titled Navigating the Urban Gender Experiences in the City. We are going to start with Swapnil Saxena, who is at the National Institute of Urban Affairs. Um, and we have about 15 minutes per uh, paper. And uh, we'll open it up for questions then. Thanks. everyone. Uh, I'm Swapnil Saxena. I'm an architect and planner by training and I currently work at the National Institute of Urban Affairs. Uh, today I would be discussing uh, my paper on gender equal cities. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad to be a part of this discussion, especially because uh, of the theme uh, of this conference, which is about equal cities. And we as a uh, group together a question uh, are actually discussing the notions of equality and equity in our urban areas uh, at a time where the uh, globally the world is facing uh, challenges posed by urbanization challenges uh, social challenges economic challenges and environmental challenges so uh, just to set context um, uh, in the Indian context, 2050, India would become the most populous country in the world as per UN estimates. And uh, with uh, this rapid rate of urbanization, uh, we will be posed by several challenges, such as uh, increased demand for housing, transport, livelihood, food, and the access to basic services. Um, Migration, uh, so there are a lot, lot many causes of urbanization, but migration and urbanization as processes are strongly interrelated. And my paper basically explores this dynamic around migration and urbanization, where uh, I'm trying to uh, link it to gender roles, and I'm trying to look at it through the gendered lens. And if you look at urbanization, it brings in positive uh, aspects but it also has an associated disadvantage with it and then more and the worst affected of this urban disadvantage are women and children women who constitute about 48 percent of the country's population uh, and this is manifested in the form of informal settlements growing poverty income inequalities basically haphazard growth which is highly exclusionary so if you look at the uh, inequality perpetuating in our cities, we can categorize it into economic uh, inequality, inequalities in representation and participation, spatial inequalities, which a lot of panelists discussed before, which manifests in the form of spatial segregation, ghettoization of space, uh, where we see clear demarcated spaces in urban areas, uh, divide between the rich and the poor, and other kinds of inequalities such as uh, which is the social inequality uh, citizenship being one of uh, one major ca uh, composition of it uh, social identity and so on and when one tries to look at all these kinds of inequalities through the gender through the perspective of gender gender inequality is something that lies at the intersection of all these inequalities uh, though a lot of progress has been made globally and uh, al also in India on ensuring equal gender equality, uh, adhering to the Sustainable Development Goals, 
all of that and we have seen movements such as the me too movement which brought about a fresh new perspective it helped uh, women uh, come out raise their voices but then uh, there is another dimension to it where we should question that uh, what uh, how does this inequality manifest in the urban life and wh what do we actually know about the urban dimension of gender based inequalities so traditional approaches to this basically look at gender as being a binary uh, classification of men and women but gender is an experience and it is it goes beyond this binary classification uh, the intersectionality of uh, various identities that a person might have uh, should be the prime consideration uh, if we want to uh, plan inclusive cities and if we want sustained growth. So uh, the right to the city approach, it, uh, as you all may know, it was an approach which uh, in the 1960s, which was a period of uh, prolonged civil unrest, there, was, there were neoliberal policies, uh, cities were being designed considering the needs of uh, men. There was uh, the kind of land use planning that happened uh, was basically disintegrated. There were uh, residential areas and recreational areas planned in silos and all uh, linked through transportation corridors. Uh, at that time, traditional planning approaches uh, considered that women are mostly homebound and uh, home-based work was something which did not get recognized in the planning approaches then. The right to the city was a response to this civil, uh, civil uh, unrest and to ensure uh, uh, economic justice through planning. It is basically a right, uh, an individual or collective right of all the residents of a city to an equal share of its benefits and to participate in its development. This comes from the World Charter for the Right to the City, which is uh, a document which is sort of a global reference and was developed over a lot of social movements, involvement of a lot of uh, uh, UN organization, multilateral organization, civil society, etc. Basically, this right should not be looked at from a legalistic point of view, but uh, it is something which is an articulation of the multiple human rights uh, and is uh, multiple human rights such as the right to adequate housing, land, food, nutrition, and so on. This right is interdependent with all of these rights and a violation of any basic human right in, for an urban dweller in a city would ultimately deny him of his right, his or her right to the city as well. So basically this approach has three uh, principles. Uh, it talks about democratic management of the city, full exercise of citizenship and the social function of urban property and the city. And when, we, uh, when uh, we try to look at it through the perspective of gender, it, I have tried to uh, analyze the first principle through, uh, through principles of uh, representation and participation and questioning women's uh, participation in the democratic, uh, democratic management of the city, participation in city planning processes, participation in control of resource and expenditure. When uh, we look at exercise of citizenship, it is the uh, participation of women in active citizenship in the, in the country. And the, uh, the third one, which is the social function of urban property in the city, it, is, it basically talks about equal and safe access to public goods and services and uh, equal and safe access to public space. And this is closely interrelated to the realization of the multiple human rights that I just mentioned. In the Indian context, if we try to analyze participation of women, particularly across levels of government, uh, one can see that in the highest decision-making uh, elected uh, positions in our country, in India, uh, women are highly underrepresented, just 12% in the central cabinet of ministers. In both houses of parliament, there's underrepresentation. And you, uh, the third graph just shows 9% of women out of the total over 4,100 member of legislative assemblies in, in our country. Th though the local government structure in the country has mandated about one third seats, uh, seats uh, reserved for women, uh, there are uh, multiple opinions about it. There, there are two camps, one which believes that uh, women are just proxy candidates uh, 
and the other group which says that the participation of women in the local government has brought about change. There are global studies which say that since local governments are governments which are closest to the people, uh, women's representation in, in this uh, structure of the government ha uh, has the potential to bring changes in the overall economic uh, scenario of the country, in the GDP and, uh, and also in the prosperity of the country like the earlier panel was uh, discussing. Uh, participation could be ensured by two ways. The first is getting them in the system and the second and the more important one is getting them heard. Uh, getting them in the system can be ensured by equal representation by, but by getting them heard it has multiple dimensions to it. It also relates to the power in decision making processes. It, it uh, is closely related to mainstreaming of gender issues and concerns and ultimately budgeting, which is a tool that uh, kind of uh, re uh, is closely related to mainstreaming. Uh, in the Indian context, uh Respond, mainstreaming is more about responding equally to the needs of both men and women. It is about, uh, it's not just about a separate, uh, creating of a separate bu budget for uh, ensuring equality, but it is about uh, making, uh, making fiscal changes, making policy changes that will have outcome oriented results uh, that are prolonged and that are sustained. Participation in city planning, if you look at the uh, urban planning exercise as in, in, the, in the traditional context, it is something which is buried in myths and assumptions. The first major assumption is that urban planning as an exercise is gender neutral. Now when one makes that assumption, we also say that uh, w the needs of women and men in a city are the same. Often when one says that it is a gender neutral exercise, it is mostly coming from a male uh, dominated perspective. Uh, so uh, basically realizing that the way women experience cities uh, is very much related to their work patterns in the city. Their work patterns would determine the way they the travel, commute in the city, the way they navigate the city and hence their opinions and their experiences as a part of the city planning process become extremely critical. The second assumption is that gender equality always becomes an afterthought in the planning exercise. So uh, while, while uh, a planning exercise is being done, th uh, the concentration is always on solving the bigger problems of this, bigger problems such as air quality, solving poverty, but it ignores the, the fact that uh, the real problem is not, of, uh, is not poverty or air quality, it is inequality and if one addresses inequality, there are uh, these other interrelated, interconnected uh, issues and concerns of urban areas will automatically be catered to. And the third myth, myth it's an assumption that it's a woman's job. Uh, if you look at representation, if you look at the Ministry of uh, Women and Child Welfare, if you look at departments that work for women and social issues, they are highly they have only female representation, and it is considered that it has to be a woman, uh, you know, woman's job. We need more men coming uh, coming forward and attempting to uh, participate in the city city uh, planning processes that cater to the needs of women too. Uh, in the urban planning scenario in India, you can see it's an alarming figure, just point two, three planners for about one lakh persons. That's not even one planner per a lakh of persons. Uh, and a lot of uh, issues at the institutional level and the, at the bureaucratic uh, levels. So we question why gender matters. And I've uh, particularly put out this picture. It can bring a lot of opinions. Uh, though times are changing, uh, there are a lot of men coming uh, coming and engaging in house-based work. But I've put out this picture just to re, uh, reinstate the fact that 
the multiple responsibilities and the multiple roles that women have sort of make their make their commute and navigation in the city more complex the the way they experience cities they is complex and it's very diverse in nature and hence it has uh, uh, and that is why gender matters it uh, the traditional approaches uh, they uh, perpetuate uh, gender hierarchies so the planning of the city should cater and should allow women to choose uh, uh, their uh, the way they navigate the city growing gendered fear of public spaces because of lack of participation and lack of representation the voices are uh, not, the voices of women are not heard uh, in the formal uh, formal decision making processes of the country and because of which a uh, lot of surveys like the one done in 2016 in delhi came out with a with a result that about 60% of the women in the uh, in the city feel unsafe to travel and to live in the city this the respondents include women senior citizens and children but it's very important to question this fear of public space because uh, it is it's not just uh, about the women it is about the gender as a whole men experience uh, lack of safety in the form of thefts and uh, robberies whereas women are uh, victims of uh, assault sexual assault or molestation it manifests in multiple ways and gender also matters because it is uh, gender is high very uh, closely interrelated to the global concern of climate change women are the ones which are closest to home based work they are the ones who are responsible for gathering producing food collecting water and their life their work patterns are majorly dependent on their access to basic services also in the context of climate change and when uh, when uh, women are the first who know who have uh, quick solutions to adaptation so i think uh, that is why i have put uh, these three uh, things under the participation aspect also a uh, concern yes almost one and uh, i've tried to relate the uh, concerns in urban planning to how it has gender based implications so when there's limited access to livelihood and basic services it it one example of that could be inadequate or no access to sanitation or toilet uh toilets lead to increased risk of sexual assault lead, uh, leads to loss of time uh and uh, loss of time to negotiate access to service there are uh, other factors the limits and the uh, the limit to right to own land and inherit property basically the uh, denial of secure tenure increases poverty and it pushes women into uh, greater poverty and multiple human rights violations uh, limit if there's uh, lack of safety inadequate uh, measures to ensure safety in the city uh, one example is it it puts women at the risk of sexual assault it inhibits their mobility and their right to the city and all of this has a trickle down effect when there's no representation in the decision making uh, process at the national level it trickles down to lack of representation at the state and finally it it trickles down to the society where the question of the basic human right to even uh, the right to choice uh, becomes critical the social function of urban property it is a no, it's again one principle of the right to the city which uh, includes an obligation to use property in ways that contribute to the collective good uh, so again recognizing and ensuring right to land and redefining public interest and revoking the principles of eminent domain uh, just i'll just take two more minutes uh so it's important to ensure that women have access and control over vital resources and this is very essential to the changing gender power relations and patterns in the uh, globally today so this is my last and final slide where i've tried to take the right to the city forward and try to look at how else can right to the city be addressed so there are various ways addressing the indivisibility of human rights uh non discrimination and inclusion and addressing gender equality which could be done in n number of ways by considering right to the city as the right to a gendered city and taking an intersectional approach to gender rather than the binary classification 
uh, that traditional approaches take. Uh, we need strong uh, initiatives which uh, basically develop out of consultations, uh, making more women uh, participate in the development uh, agenda of the country, recognizing home-based work, uh, addressing the access to safe uh, housing, safe shelter, creating spaces for homeless women, victims of domestic violence, ensuring representation, participation, gender-sensitive urban planning, which is integrating hard and soft components, which I earlier mentioned, and encouraging collaborations. Uh, f uh, for a need uh, which will finally address gender sensitive policy making in the country. I think because of lack of time, I would end it at that and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Swapnil. Next, we have uh, Ankita and Tejendra. Yeah, you can get started. We'll uh, have all the questions in the end for all the panelists. Well, uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Ankita Gaur, and he's my colleague, Tejendra. To give us your back, uh, our background, we are architects and urban designers, and we are currently affiliated with DIT University assistant professors. And firstly, I would like to thank Swapnil for setting us the stage for us. She talked about the right to city, and we are basically exploring this right in terms for public spaces. We are going to present our paper on spatial justice, gender, and urban transport nodes. So if we talk about the urban public spaces in cities, they form a very integral part of the structure of the entire city. If we look at it, they are the physical manifestation of the social as well as the cultural aspects of the cities. How they are produced in the cities, they could be in forms of parks, plazas, playgrounds, markets, bazaars. And since, like she has said earlier, we are now initiating the entire dialogue of why we see much more men as compared to women in our country in terms of public spaces. Given the fact that uh, it's almost 50% of the population in our country is women, whenever we look at urban spaces, whatever we see is more percentages of men. So why are we taking urban transport nodes only as a specific public space? All the various typologies that are described earlier have been explored much in the context of gender inclusivity, but because the Indian Railways is currently going under a lot of modernization, they are taking out their smart uh, uh, proposals to make the uh, railway stations much more gender inclusive. So we're exploring how that particular environment of railway stations can be made much more safer for women. Because if we see uh, almost everybody travels, we spend a lot of time traveling. An entire urban transport node can be explored in terms of how they, it generates a certain kind of character. Character in the terms of it has a built environment. It also it generates that built environment generates a lot of informalities. Informalities in terms of you, you can say vendors, eating, shopping, and a lot of optional activities that we term as. Now, if you look at those optional activities, whatever we see is mostly men who are dominating that particular space. So if that they dominate that particular space, do women actually feel safe enough to go there? The entire railway station, if we take it as a nucleus, and if we see how much women feel safe to access those entire area, is a basic area of exploration. So the paper, it looks at the notion of justice, space, and mobility through the lens of gender. We are going to try to understand the reasons for the formulation of gender exclusive spaces near the railway stations as a nucleus. So uh, coming to the literature, literature part of it, uh, since we are exploring the transport nodes and the notion of the public spaces um, in the transport nodes, so we have done a basic and um, uh, a basic literature review of how these uh, uh, transport nodes are acting as a public spaces. So Bertolini here says that uh, any important transport node in a city is, is also an important public place in the city. So coming to the notion of public space, it is a character. It is being characterized by three important aspects, which are the uh, activities. The second is the urban form, and third is the image. So the activities, uh, the urban form, which is uh, which is the built environment, it forms the activities, which gives rise to the activities, and ultimately it forms a kind of 
image in the uh, in the minds of the people who are accessing this so we can actually say that these are these, these are looking as three but they are not actually three but they are only two so the first thing is like the physical attributes and the second thing is the human construct so when we did a detailed uh, literature review we got to know some of the aspects which actually influence these uh, physical attributes and also the human um, uh, uh, human um, uh, notion of it so uh, coming to the methodology so firstly we have taken this railway station area of uh, hyderabad and after that we have done some initial uh, first hand observations through the mappings and after that we went for the detailed surveys of uh, individual interviews so this is the one of the questionnaires which we prepared and we which uh, we asked uh, almost like 100 women uh, across 15 uh, days of time so this is the study area this the main reason for this taking this uh, sikandarabad railway station area in hyderabad is because uh, this represents the uh, kind of character which most of the railway stations in indian cities are uh, containing presently so it has got it, this is a kind of inner city railway station which has got uh, uh, which is a headquarters of south central railways and it has got two me metro stations because of the uh, the need of the transportation and it has got uh, five um, uh, bus terminals in the in the vicinity of 1 km so uh, the first thing which we did was we uh, actually looked at the radius of 400 meters and 8 100 meters according to the planning recommendations of uh, transit oriented development and after that we did a peg sheet analysis uh, by taking 800 meters walkable distance through the roads so based on that we have formulated and delineated this entire area and then looked into the historical background of this area because uh, th uh, this this situation is similar to in most of the railway stations in indian cities uh, so then uh, we actually looked at the the three major aspects which is the urban morphology which is also called as the physical setting of the area the physical setting of the area has a, a very great influence on the way people behave in the, in that particular area the first thing which we looked at was the urban transformations that are happening in the area in terms of the built environment uh, the second thing is the how the particular uses of the buildings are generating the activeness of the public uh, of the particular public realm Uh, in this entire area and the third thing um, which we um, uh, uh can we see okay so here yeah. so this particular map it is showing the kind of ownership pattern so most of the land that you are seeing here in the blue in the red color it is completely under the ownership of the railways and the rest of the area is all the private ownership and the green area showing here is under the government ownership so the kind of ownership of the urban environment has a huge influence on on the on the way the public realm is acting in there so uh, after that we did an analysis of the building heights uh, to understand the, what is the uh, the kind of uh, the enclosures and also the kind of street uh, patterns through the um, uh, through the uh, figure ground analysis so this basically tells us like what is the permeability the level of, of permeability and also what the the street interlinkages because uh, the many of the women which we uh, interviewed they feel uh, they felt much more safer uh, you know Uh, walking on the main roads like these roads than going into the inter road in internal roads because uh, they actually felt very uncomfortable and also unsafe uh, exploring the internal parts of the internal parts because of the lack of um, visibility so uh, after that we can actually see Uh, this is the extent of the realm which is majorly uh, used by the women and which are these are the areas which are in red color which are uh, uh, generally avoided by the women and then these are some of the uh, uh movement patterns which we have uh, mapped the the first one is related to the interchange users because i have said like there are uh, five uh, transport nodes uh, bus terminals and one railway station and two metro stations so this is the extent of public realm used by the women for the interchange purposes so the second map is showing about um, uh, the tourist and the uh, and some of the map Uh, the buildings which are marked here are the hotels and the rail and the uh, restaurants and after that we have the ex we have some of the routes which are taken by the uh, school children and uh, college going uh, children col college going students so this is the entire mapping of the area which is showing the uh, uh, the the level of um, um, usage of the particular street and after that these are the some of the time based um, uh, usage maps which we pro um, map so uh, after that there is a detailed analysis of the activity mapping is done so to understand what are the type of activities uh, uh, in which women are involved in so generally we can see this entire the area which is th this is a railway station and uh, these are the metro stations 
one is here and the second metro station is on the on the road which is an elevated metro station so this entire public realm which we are seeing is highly congested by the movement of uh, the uh, uh, vehicles and also there are too many activities happening at the same time so uh, generally as as per the tod uh, principles uh, by uh, the india go india government it actually says that uh, the activeness of the public realm can be created by the buildings but in turn too much of activities also disturbs the way we actually use the uh, use a particular street so uh, even if uh, a woman is standing here in front of the railway station but still uh, going in and accessing a metro station is very uh, inconvenient for her because too many activities and also the fear of uh, safety uh, uh, lack of safety in this particular area is one of the uh, reasons why uh, uh, women doesn't want to go to uh, nearby um, modes of transportation so uh, ultimately we also uh, mapped uh, some of the image which is like a mental image of the people uh, of the women uh, so here the first thing which we did was like uh, through the surveys we actually uh, find out different aspects of uh, what are their uh, level of satisfaction uh, with respect to the uh, the the choice of routes which they wanted to take to access the mode uh, mode of transportation and second uh, is also how f safe uh, they feel in in this particular area and so on uh, we have uh, another some 13 categories of um, questions we have so uh, then we uh, so finally uh, what we could uh, actually conclude from this entire thing is uh, uh, the morphology activity patterns and the image has a huge impact on the way the women uh, access the pub public transportation nodes so it is also the fact that um, the lack of um, uh, infrastructure in terms of the sidewalks in in terms of uh, the lack uh, the availability of parking spaces which creates huge problem for them and uh, so hence we have uh, from this entire study we came uh, we have uh, formulated this uh, indicators which will uh, kind of help to understand the spatial justice for women in uh, transport nodes so first is like when we look at urban morphology the choice of routes like which uh, because women are forced to take a certain route although like the the urban area is very vast and the second thing is like sense of safety is one of the important issues because it, it has to be a kind of natural um, um, natural um, uh, a safety uh, as, as a psychological thing which they should which it should come than the artificial surveillance and third is access to the infrastructure like the sidewalks uh, public toilets and um, the parking spaces are very important and the activity patterns in terms of the social interactions because of the lack of the infrastructure this is the kind of ultimate result so the the kind of uh, indicators which we are showing here are not uh, cannot be seen as uh, independent or isolated uh, indicators but they have to be looked at as a kind of holistic um, um, indicators which has a kind of interrelation with the previous or the next one so uh, yes with this we would like to conclude thank you Okay, we have uh, Malvika and Abhishek next. Thank you, Divya. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend uh, our gratitude to IHS for selecting our abstract and inviting us here. This is really amazing for us because we've, we're both students of IHS and it's uh, really nice to come back and present in front of uh, our faculty and just get their comments. Um, so our paper is basically focused on uh, understanding the gendered impact of uh, evictions on uh, livelihoods. Uh, so based on uh, field work that was conducted in Sabda Ghevda, which is a resettlement colony in Northwest Delhi, uh, we try to understand uh, what, what are the kind of factors that influence the labor market decisions that women make uh, in the resettlement colony. Uh, we also kind of wanted to um, capture the range of work and the different forms of work that women undertake in the everyday. Uh, and you know, uh, through that kind of uh, really understand what constitutes women's work in a resettlement colony. 
uh, why do women take up certain forms of work when they do and uh, what are the kind of negotiations that they make to structure paid work and unpaid work uh, while taking up work. Um, so um, just a bit of a context uh, review. Uh, so Sardha Gevda is a resettlement colony that came up in 2006, 2007. Uh, when uh, uh, Delhi was going this massive re-envisioning and uh, large-scale construction of um, residential enclaves, entertainment centers, etc., for the Commonwealth Games. And uh, uh, numerous sites, uh, people were evicted from numerous sites across the city, which were centrally located. But uh, we've kind of marked out four of, four of those sites in this map uh, from where our respondents came from. Uh, for this study, we basically uh, spoke to around 30 women and we used co uh, qualitative tools including semi-structured interviews and observations. Um, and so through the map, you can see that, uh, you know, the, the average distance between the places where people were evicted from and Savra Kevra is around 35 kilometers. So that is the kind, that is the level of displacement that people faced uh, in those rounds of evictions where they were uh, literally th thrown out of their houses and just, uh, you know, put into this place. Um, so, um, we understand that uh, th through, the n through the narratives of our respondents, we understood that, uh, you know, evictions uh, and resettlement uh, basically kind of, um, uh, it kind of aggravated vulnerabilities of many of those people who were evicted. And those uh, vulnerabilities were kind of across many aspects of their lives. So, uh, people became houseless, jobless, their families got disintegrated, uh, they were marginalized and thrown into this periphery of the city where no transport or no basic services were available. Um, and there was a real danger and risk to their, uh, uh, their own safety and the safety of their possessions, their children, uh, social and community ties which were fostered over years were broken up, etc. So this infographic basically captures that whole gamut of vulnerabilities that people faced. Um, when we spoke to women and we kind of wanted to understand their experience of eviction, what came out is the level of shock that they underwent when they first encountered Savra because it was this uh, swamp, marshy land uh, with nothing uh, there except uh, tall, tall grass, uh, grass fields which were as high as their shoulders according to their description. Uh, there were no services, uh, no houses um, and yeah, it was basically... Um, Basically, nothing was there. And so uh, now if you see Savda, it's a very, very different place. And so we've tried to capture that uh, decade-long change uh, in the resettlement colony through this uh, infographic. The lower part of the infographic basically tries to capture how condition of houses, access to services, and access, access to finance changed over the years from 2006 to 2019. So uh, at one end where you have complete houselessness and people kind of living in houses uh, kacha houses made, made up of thatch uh, and bars and, you know, cots uh, to a place where now the colony is uh, populated with G plus 2, G plus 3 structures and people have individual toilets, people have access to uh, transport uh, which has improved over the years but it's still obviously uh, not kind of, um, you know, adequate. Uh, people have electricity, people have drainage, etc. So the lower part of the infographic kind of uh, captures that change. Uh, the upper part of the infographic basically is uh, what we wanted to focus on. So we wanted to kind of understand how uh, this change in the access to uh, <coughs> services and the condition of the houses, uh, what kind of impact did that have on the kinds of work that women took up in the colony through, through this decade-long process of change. So um, we have agricultural work, domestic work, factory work, home-based work, daily wage work and self-employed work uh, as the forms of work which we've marked out. And as we see, uh, just broadly, as the condition improves in the colony, so does the basket of choices available to women. We would come back, we would keep coming back to those uh, lines uh, later to kind of explain the uh, relationship between uh, chain, uh, forms of work and the changes in materiality and access to services. Uh, this is just basically how the settlement changed. So like I said, it just changed from uh, houses made of thatch roofs to something that, um, yeah. Um, so as I said, we really wanted to kind of understand the influence that this change had on women's work. And we also wanted to dig deeper into 
you know because of these changes how did the negotiations that women have had to make to take up work to earn income how have they changed for agricultural work uh, were mo uh, women prefer payments in kind rather than payments in cash because uh, as their husbands worked and earned uh, money in cash that money was used for day to day expenses but the uh, the kind of payments that women got like uh, baskets of wheat or packets of milk every day or uh, vegetables etc those were used to sustain the family and the and their children uh, through the time of extreme precarity and insecurity um uh while going to work just one thing uh while going to work one thing that women had to be mindful of uh, like i said there was nothing there in the colony at that time and the most crucial thing for them was to take care of their children and that came out repeatedly in their narratives so younger children would be carried off into the agricultural farms and women would have to constantly take breaks between their um, work to take care of their children so that kind of shows us how their work was structured when when they were on the fields because they would have to constantly take breaks to feed them to make them sleep to all of that and one other thing which structured their work timings was also the access to water because access to water has until very recently been very erratic and uh, sudden in the in the resettlement colony and at that time only one uh, delhi jal board tanker used to come per block uh, so that would mean that women would have to rush uh, from their farms back to their homes as and when the tankers came and they had to always be on the lookout for that so these were the kind of negotiations that structured their uh, paid work at that time and the kind of income that they earned um but then as roads came up in the uh, in savda and as uh, services improved a bit uh, uh, the men started going out and they found work in the factories in tikri border and bahadurgarh which are around 3 to 4 kilometers from the resettlement colony um why i say that men went first was because uh, a huge burden of the unpaid care work and the burden of having to rebuild the entire settlement uh, their household uh, and their children's kind of uh, daily life fell on women and women took that on and it's their kind of work that has led to the uh, settlement looking uh, as how it looks today so um, one of the kinds of work which became available to women later on was factory work after men started going uh, women also followed but uh, there were some of the uh, some of the reasons why women did not take up factory work in large numbers were that uh, the factories only hired those workers who could uh, do compulsory overtime and women did not want to do compulsory overtime because as i said many of them prioritized taking care of their children and taking care of their uh, household uh much more than earning of uh, uh income so that was one of the reasons uh of course other things which we keep on hearing in uh, literature is also hostile work environment in the factories was one of the reasons that women did not feel safe to go and work in the uh factory spaces and of course uh women had two options to travel to the factory one was to walk through the fields uh, for 3 to 4 kilometers that would mean around 45 minutes to 1 hour of walk uh through these thick fields and uh, many of them reported cases of theft robbery and even rapes that occurred while they were traveling to work um and the other option was to kind of uh uh take bus which was very erratic and yeah uh so just moving on um so one of the other forms of work that be, uh, that was quite prevalent uh, in the period before resettlement was daily wage work as construction 
laborers uh, and um, a, a lot of men in Savda continue to do such work by uh, staying you know during the week in the city and only visiting families in the weekend but a lot of women who used to do older women who we spoke to who used to do daily wage work before had stopped that after moving here and uh, generally the um, uh, Generally, it was understood that daily wage work is highly erratic. So even the women who did take up daily wage work often also did other forms of work to make up in the lean periods. And um, moving on to domestic work, this was the most prevalent form of employment among women uh, prior to resettlement because uh, the informal settlements where they were living was very proximate to middle and upper income residential enclaves so it was uh, something that was very accessible from their places of living and uh, uh, so but then the eviction uh, the effect that eviction had was that uh, there was a long break so at, for the first two or three years women did not have the option to uh, continue this work uh, for lack of transit for lack of uh, roads even and later when roads and uh, sort of bus services started, many women have now gone back to doing domestic work, but still uh, trans the, the, the sort of amount of money spent on transit as well as the time cost of that. So the work, uh, the transit time is almost six hours. So three hours one way, which is almost as much as the working day that remains completely uncompensated. So there's a fall of real wages as well. And we also saw that domestic work, because it involved such long hours, were usually done by women uh, in households where there were more than one uh, uh, female uh, adult. So either uh, young, uh, you know, older children, older female children, or sisters-in-law, who could be relied on to take up the domestic uh, unpaid care work when uh, women went out for paid work. The other kind of uh, employment that that we're seeing now is it this, in this category we're actually talking about a range of things so casual wage work now includes things like working in working as helpers in shops that have come up in the surrounding areas it involves uh, uh, ironing services uh, e-rickshaw drivers things like that and the, another major category are some home-based workers some women who used to do home-based work have now started uh, subcontracting to other women. And one of the things that we noted in this was that uh, women who could take up self-employment usually came from households which in, uh, the income of where you know, it was relatively more stable. And the other, uh, out of all the three women suppliers that we spoke to, none of them had been evicted and resettled in Savda, rather they were people who had bought plots and sort of moved there. So eviction was not a structural shock that they had to deal with. Uh, now I'll spend some time to talk about home-based work because this is right now in Savda the most prevalent form of employment among women. And as you can see from this table, it's highly underpaid. It's uh, uh, the peace rates, most of the women are subcontracted workers who work on peace rates. And um, almost four to six hours, over four to six hours of work each day uh, brings, a, you know, a maximum of up to 2,500 rupees, which is hardly anything. Uh, but when you talk to women, uh, one of the things that come out is that apart from the fact that it's underpaid, it is a form of work that allows them to balance care work along with paid work. And that is a choice that is highly valued. Uh, in, uh, valued in Savda because uh, even even if it is understood as care work which might be un, uh, non-economic in the present, women understand that is a long-term investment that they are making in order for family stability, in order to invest in children's education so that they will have a set of choices that they do not at present. Um, and home-based work is also particularly uh, interesting to look at because it helps us visualize a lot of costs that women bear which are usually hidden. So one of the ways in which it comes out is this constant spatial readjustments that women home-based workers have to do 
in order to accommodate paid work within the house. The house is already very small. So the same room in which paid work is taken up in the afternoon uh, looks very different at another point of time in the day where when cooking is happening there, leisure, children are studying there. So the, these constant rearranging of furniture, utilizing even the smallest spaces available are costs that women are bearing. And this is also reflected in uh, time use in the day as well because uh, home-based work is always structured around the other kind of responsibilities. So it might it's a very fragmented use of time uh, during the day. And there's also a lot of seasonality. So women do not have much of a say in how much work is available to them at certain month in the year or in a certain week. And uh, they need to work around that. So to quickly conclude with some key observations that we had, one was that eviction is a structural shock that actually nullifies uh, whatever achievements uh, urban poor, usually migrants, have been able to make in the city. So a lot of people who had to, you know, sort of start from square one in Savda were people who had already done this process once, maybe 20 to 30 years back, a generation back. And these sort of achievements in setting up a house, getting some access to services are nullified by the process of eviction. And what we see a decade after resettlement or, you know, uh, actually we are very uncomfortable with using the word resettlement. It's just a displacement. So after that, after a decade, we see that there's some recovery that has happened in housing, in service access, but the impact on livelihood is something that is felt even to this day. So it's a very long-term impact that is not accounted for in models of uh, rehabilitation. And especially, uh, we want to note that there are some gendered costs that are, uh, that are there in rehabilitation which do not uh, find a place in these models. So we want to again, once again, make the point that uh, it's crucial to sort of uh, not destroy the place-based networks and the spatial connection to urban centers and instead view urban poor settlements as productive clusters uh, which should be upgraded through service provision such that people can oh, at least over generations build, incrementally build up uh, a life. And um, just to note that uh, given that women are much more spatially embedded in the home and immediate neighborhood, we need to break the view of the home being a non-productive space and uh, help visualize the hidden costs which are borne by women currently. Um, and again, we see that women's work choices are also quite dynamic. So across lifespan or across, uh, you know, depending on their other care responsibilities, uh, they choose to move from one work to the other because different things make sense at different points. So how can livelihood policy be responsive in order to enable better outcomes for women workers? Um. Hi. Um, firstly, uh, really lovely uh, presentations by everyone. Congratulations for some really stimulating uh, conversation. I have uh, two things to sort of comment slash ask. One is more specifically towards the first presentation. And then in general, like for everyone in that sense. Um, I think Swapnil, in your first presentation, there was like one comment that you made about uh, when you're talking about women planners. And I think there was a talk comment also that like, you know, more men need to also come forward in that sense. Um, but this is also the kind of an argument that a lot of men in politics make against reserving space for women. Okay, why are we constantly framing this as only a women's issue, men also suffer, etc., so on and so forth. The, the truth is women are, are way more affected. They are way more affected. They, they do suffer way more from structural inequality, something that you've also mentioned in your presentation over and over again. So um, can we not dilute this narrative by bundling men constantly in this right to access to the city? Do you not think like whenever there's a marginalized group or a group which has unequal access in a structural sense, they should be the focus of that. So like why are we constantly trying to like on one hand talk about like women need more space needs to be made for women, but also, you know, men also suffer safety and everything. So maybe some thoughts on that would be interesting to hear your perspective on that. 
and in general like a like comment like you know from everybody else as well like we've heard some really uh, interesting thoughts on gender as a lens in urban planning access and uh, displacement and how it uh, affects lives um just i was curious if there are any thoughts on space mobility from the lens of caste as well uh, because uh, even from an intersectional lens the way upper caste women will navigate a city is has been sociologically demonstrated to be different from how low caste women would experience the same city and the same economy and geography and so on and so forth so if anybody has any thoughts on that that would also be very interesting to hear from from you all thank you uh thank you it's a very quick question um here <laughs> Uh, it was just maybe you said it, but I didn't hear well. Uh, could you explain more? Who is deciding the evictions and displacement, and who is uh, cho choosing the the relocation? Also, uh, is that the regional government, or maybe if you could explain it a little bit, it would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, um, I also want to really appreciate all these very different kind of approaches and pieces of work and different views and perspectives that are coming out of it. Um, so I also just wanted to ask about something that maybe we didn't really discuss, but um, I kind of see as quite relevant, especially in our um, context. Uh, and that is, we talked about like, the infrastructures of care work, unpaid care work, and other things, um, but also the infrastructures of morality that kind of come into conversations around where women move, for example, or what public spaces that they can occupy, um, and kind of if that has come up, and how women negotiate those things. Also, um, its intersection with you know sense of security and safety um, and then the way that the physical environment contributes to it and also the way that, um, you know, your family structures, even um, employers, the way that they look at women's safety, um, uh, various things like this, um, if that has come up and any perspectives on that. Uh, so to the uh, to answer the first question about the percentage of women that I mentioned in like uh, I was uh, primarily discussing uh, representation and participation and I did not intend to uh, say that the percentage of women as women planners must increase in the profession I said it's important to uh, have equal representation in all the processes uh, in the policy making processes, planning processes, and even in the legisl uh, legislation. So, um, percentage of women in planning, uh, basically, if you look at the numbers, they are alarming. But um, it's v here it is very important to address the fact that uh, when uh, you want to, uh, you know, uh, make some make a design that is inclusive that is you know sustained and something which uh, has a positive impact uh, inclusive impact on all residents of, of uh, the city it's important that all voices are heard and uh, which can be ensured through uh, equal representation and that is uh, that was the basic intention when i mentioned it was uh, it was not about just uh, bringing in women in in uh, the process Mm, yeah, I think that was the only question posed to me. Thanks. Um, I just want to answer the last question on infrastructures of morality. Um, so actually, this uh, did come up. Uh, I'm sorry, we couldn't discuss it because of paucity of time. Um, so yeah, so for example, in domestic work, um, one of the reasons why many women could not take up or did not want to take up domestic work 
was because of a sense of shame that was attached to domestic work and many women did reveal that and that can also be read from uh, from the lens of caste um, and one of the other things that we saw was that uh, several women told us that and we saw this also that domestic workers were clustered in particular areas of the settlement so block B and block C was one of the clusters where a lot of women did do domestic work and uh, several women told us that this is the kind of work that is mostly done by Bengali Hindu women. And, um, you know, we had this one uh, respondent who was um, who was Muslim and she particularly denied that this is not the kind of work that we do. This is the kind of work that mostly uh, Bengali Hindu women do. Um, so, yeah, that. And, um, and, you know, even when we went and kind of had conversations with women over there, um, despite the fact that we never asked them about their caste identity or anything uh, about their socioeconomic background or, uh, I mean, we didn't ask them um, up front. Uh, many of them chose to reveal that themselves. And, you know, so this one woman who had moved to Sabda, uh, bought uh, the house there and she was not evicted. She basically particularly said this, that, you know, I'm from a Banya caste and I'm not a Jugi Jopra wala. Um, and that is something that she... Uh, pressed on. Um, so that is also one thing which, uh, so yeah, of course, uh, from the lens of caste, definitely, and the lens of intersectionality, definitely this uh, can be read. Um, yeah. um, regarding the question on uh, who evicts and who decides uh, where people go, so uh, it depends on, uh, so most of the informal settlements are on public land, so which comes under different government agencies. But uh, I'm, I'm, I think there are other people who can answer better. But in Delhi, a lot of it is held by the development agency, which is under the central government. But uh, this kind of displacement, you can see across different scales, uh, done by different state agencies across different scales. And uh, the uh, people you uh, till now do not have any say in uh, where they are being sent. Um, uh, most of the resettlement sites are very peripheral and uh, that's they do not have much of they, they're not even given much of a notice period uh, before evictions take place maybe last two or three questions and then we have to end Uh, this is to all the the discussions, and uh, I'm wondering if in uh, the different studies there has been instances uh, of identification of uh, male champions in um, understanding if uh, what is their perspective in relationship to the gender aspect. Are they willing to participate? What are they doing about it? And uh, how far are they willing to go with this? Because I feel like it's important to have male champions if you're to ensure urban gendered perspectives. Hi, uh, good evening. I actually want to direct my question towards Ankita and Tajendra. Uh, since you're a spatial designer, I'm wondering, uh, in retrospect to your field studies, how would you uh, recognize or rather recommend spaces that are designed in the city that might, I don't want necessarily want to say pro women or since you're we talking about how they are endangered for women but rather neutral so, such that like both can exist like just a thought yeah uh, thank you thank you for wonderful presentations the last two three presentations uh, were you know actually situated in like ethnographic mode of study what i would uh, also like to see whether if you consider uh, the concept of uh, people as infrastructure uh, by Simon, uh, 
uh, and how the when the gendered lens uh, how it will actually take that concept forward uh, that would be very interesting to see uh, maybe you can think of that also thanks Uh, uh, coming to the kind of spaces, uh, um, kind of the kind of recommendations which we have given in our paper, so uh, they are looking uh, from the women perspective in terms of kind of um, equality. So equality, when we say it's a kind of um, access, is one of the way. We are uh, mostly looking at the kind of um, uh, the way the built environments. The built environment is a kind of um, creating that equal opportunity for the women. The firstly, that is the thing. So how this kind of access is different from different genders. So that is another uh, area of exploration which we did. So we didn't specifically give any kind of recommendation in terms of design, but overall in terms of how we, uh, how the settlement pattern, the entire settlement pattern, of, or the entire, the way we design the built environment, it influences the way the women uses the, um, you know uses the transport nodes. So that was the ultimate thing. So because the first thing that we uh, explored here was the built environment and how it generates the activities and how that activities ultimately creates a kind of um, activeness on the streets and that activeness generates a kind of safety for the people. Because let's say women doesn't feel um, you know much uncomfortable being uh, in a place which is a kind of um, balanced with men and women. But when it is much dominated by the men, it's like ultimately they don't want it to prefer to go in that particular story. So these are the small little things which we need to understand when we are designing the spaces. So uh, when uh, also uh, the some of the areas which we have un uh, identified in the transport nodes was mostly uh, the, the, the sidewalks are completely occupied by the men. So they are the percentage of sidewalks in the transport nodes in Indian cities are very less. Firstly, let's say we, what we have identified through our study was 10 to 15 percent of it. So within that, so within that uh, 10 to 15 percent also, they have been occupied by the men for the various activities. So that is where our designing uh, is a, a kind of. Um, um, uh, uh, taking a back step. So one, the infrastructure which we are providing in the transport node should be equal for everyone. And at the same time, some of the infrastructural add-ons like the metros and all, which are disturbing the entire uh, the urban uh, built environment there, is also because of the kind of um, the relationship with the women. So earlier, the smaller uh, uh, the street patterns uh, are much more uh, likely to invite more activities, but because of the metro and widening of the streets so the kind of relationship with the street and the eyes on streets so these kind of concepts have completely been uh, taken away from the area so those are the design aspects which we have recommended in terms of those three uh, specific uh, components of the place so when we look at the transport nodes from the place perspective we definitely have to take care of these three things and within that also uh, we have to look at those specific things which we have recommended in our paper for the uh, design recommendations. Thank you. Um, just to add to what he is saying, basic choice, uh, whatever we say is like the mobility pattern for women is much more different from men. They don't have that much choice options to move around the entire city as compared to men. Men can even take longer routes. If supposedly I have to travel a distance of 800 meters and it's a larger block length. If I talk typically about how the built environment creates a difference in mobility patterns. If that entire 800 meter of block length does not have much options for me to perforate and go through by other <coughs> modes of transport or, or just by the, you know, just by walking simple itself, then that creates a lot of difference in sense of security also sense of safety also so, if, so just by basically ensuring more permeability smaller block, block lengths maybe uh, maybe we can ensure a gender neutral environment where women have much more option and like he said since we do not have that much you know availability of space for women to walk that's why we see more men on the sidewalks as compared to women because that basic choice to move around itself is not given to us and also like he was terming about formal activities the kind of building use that this certain environment has. This um, We can simply say that formal activities would be like, what's the building use? If I say it's a hardware shop, definitely that particular type of building character would, won't support informal activities. Now, when there are certain kind of formal activities, like if it's a clothing market, you are bound to see if it's 
if I give you an environment where there are supposedly f four clothing shops, you are bound to have some sort of eatery around in that area because a lot of diversified user group would be coming to that area. But if I give you in a similar situation four hardware shops or mechanic shops or just simply saying phone repair shops, you are not bound to find a lot of informalities in that area. So in that certain kind of built environment, women won't meal, you know, feel much safe as compared to the environment where you see a diversified group. So ensuring that particular kind of built environment won't, will also help us in ensuring a gender neutral spaces. I think we need to close because uh, we are going to get ready for the plenary. We have about five minutes. We can take a short break uh, as we set up. Uh, we'll see you in five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.